good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If I can uh, just have your attention for a few minutes so we can commence this evening's uh, proceedings. Um, welcome to the uh, AIT Centre tonight and uh, to what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking and simulating uh, presentation from Professor Peter Newman. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Greg Edmonds. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for Auckland Transport. And it's my pleasure on behalf of Auckland Council to welcome you here tonight for tonight's presentation. Um, before I start, I'd just like to uh, make a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, regulations. If you could just turn your phones on to silent if you have them, please, so that they don't disrupt proceedings. If you need to use the bathrooms, you'll know that they're out to the left. And in the event of an emergency and the, uh, and the evacuation siren sound, please uh, assemble out in Aotea Square. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, your Worship the Mayor, I'm not sure whether he's here or not yet, but he will be here shortly. He's on his way, so welcome to him. Uh, welcome to the uh, Deputy Mayor as well if she's here, and also to the, the councillors and local board members uh, who have come along tonight. So welcome, uh, everybody. Um, I'd like to just note the uh, sponsors for tonight's event. Uh, special thanks to uh, Razine, uh, to Architectural Designers New Zealand, and to Jelkin Holmes, who support these series of uh, international speakers that we bring in from all over the world to help us educate. And to the supporters also of these events, uh, Boffa Miskell, Jib, Patterson's Architects, and Brookfield's Lawyers. Um, without the support of those, um, obviously these sorts of events wouldn't happen, so many thanks for your ongoing support. Um, today, uh, just a couple of hours ago, um, I had the pleasure, along with the Mayor and others, uh, and the Prime Minister to, um, uh, I suppose, uh, mark a historic occasion in Auckland Transport uh, and Auckland Council's uh, calendar. And uh, this afternoon at Britomart Station, the Mayor turned on the 25,000 volts of electricity on the Auckland Electric Network in preparation for the rollout of our electric trains. And we're now in countdown mode. We have 27 days left till we go into operation. Uh, and I'd just like to take you through a few slides. I, I don't mean to steal Professor Newman's uh, thunder. But I'm sure he'll talk about trains at some part of his uh, presentation. But for us, this is a huge milestone. And up on the uh, screen there, you'll see some slides. I'll just take you through them for a couple of minutes. This is a $600 million investment by the Crown and Auckland Council to electrify uh, and bring electric trains into, uh, into Auckland to bring us into the 21st century. You'll see one of them there being uh, wrapped up in Spain. Uh, you'll see uh, another one arriving uh, on the ship. The first one arrived in August last year, and they've been in testing and commissioning since. Uh, that they came in all sealed up by sea freight, uh, and you'll see one being unwrapped in a second. <laughs> and that's what they look like when they're unwrapped. There's, uh, there's one of the new trains in the, uh, in the depot at the moment. There'll be 57 of them when we roll them right out. Um, and here's another quick little video for you. This, has been, this is on test, so for the last four or five months, we've been testing them predominantly at night. Um, the uh, trains have been running on the southern line, which is now electrified uh, for testing purposes. Uh, top speed, 121 kilometres an hour. Uh, we won't run them at that speed on the network, obviously, but that's uh, what we've tested them at. A couple of interesting things to, to note. When we tested them, uh, we filled them full of sandbags. People say, what did you do that for? So we're having to simulate the weight of carrying uh, the passengers. So we filled them full of sandbags to make sure on braking and cornering, etc., they were performing to spec, and you'll see them still pretty new there. And inside internal, big wide doors for easy access for disabilities and uh, push chairs, uh, bicycles, etc. Kids coming on. You'll see tonight from 7 o'clock we start a TV commercial, a series of commercials welcoming the trains into Auckland. So this is the first part of cutting that. Bicycles inside, as you can see, which is pretty simple. And disabled access, again, very good for uh, disabled access and wheelchairs. And there's the uh, train actually sitting at Remuer Station a couple of weeks ago. So just thought I'd give you a little bit of an insight to see that we are moving things along in Auckland. Uh, and uh, as I say, the 27th of April, the only hangar line will be the first service. There's a competition running. The first 5,000 people to enter will be able to go on the first services on the 27th, which is a Sunday. 
and on the Monday morning on the 28th we'll start full revenue services uh, with only hung at a bit of mark both ways for the electric trains. So uh, I'm sure that you'll all be looking forward to it. But you didn't come here to hear about that, so I will move on. It's my pleasure tonight to welcome our uh, international guests. Um, professor Peter Newman, he's a distinguished professor of sustainability at Curtin University and a director of the Curtin University Sustainability Policy. He is on the board of Institute Australia, inf sorry, Infrastructure Australia and is a lead author for Transport and the IPCC. He's authored a number of books, including Resilient Cities, Responding to Peak Oil and Climate Change, and Sustainable Cities, Overcoming Automobile Dependence with Jeff Kenworthy, which was launched in the White House in 1999. In 2001 to 2003, Peter directed the production of Western Australia's sustainability strategy in the Department of the Premier and Cabinet. In 2004 and 2005, he was a sustainability commissioner in Sydney, advising the government on planning and transport issues. Professor Peter Newman has recently received uh, one of the Australia's highest honours by, by being appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia for his contributions to urban design and sustainable transport. And I understand, Peter, you will receive that award this Friday uh, of this week, which is fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Newman to the stage. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here on the day the electrification switch was turned on. Um, I have come to Auckland many times and uh, talked up this day. Um, met with Christine Fletcher <laughs> earlier on uh, and Bob Harvey back in the early days in Waitakere and, and putting in um, the hard yards on why electrification and extension of rail projects were important. Now, um, Auckland conversations, conversations between cities are really important. Jane Jacobs um, said that that was the basis of economic development, that cities find out what each other is doing and copy it and try to improve on it and, and we learn from each other and that's the way we progress. Um, and in many ways, Auckland and Perth have had this relationship for some time. We are similar cities, growing fast, uh, becoming 21st century global cities rather quickly. Uh, not a lot of tradition from the 19th century in terms of, you know, like the Melbourne and Sydney's, uh, um, and having to create a new future. So uh, having these conversations between Perth and Auckland is really uh, what I want to especially mention tonight because I can't tell you much about what to do, especially seeing you've pulled the switch, it's, it's, that's my job over. Um, but there's a lot of other things to do and perhaps you can learn from some of the things we've done in Perth and, and I'm sure we can learn from some of the things you're doing and in conversation with the Mayor this afternoon, uh, he seemed to be wanting to take on some of the ideas we've been developing in Perth but still haven't done. <coughs> so uh, maybe you'll beat us to it, I'll come to that. The first thing I want to talk about is the theory of urban fabrics, which is the, the way I now describe how to understand cities. Um, and essentially it says there are three cities, not just one. Um, there's a walking city, a transit city and a car city. And in my hometown of Fremantle, that's part, it was a walking city. It was built in the 19th century before any kind of motorised transport. And there are various sub-centres that you can see evolving as walking cities. Uh, the transit city was built from the late 19th century along the tram and train lines. But mostly, Auckland and Perth have grown with the car. And coming to terms with that and seeing how we adapt now as many of the issues of the car become very obvious is, is something important to face. What it, the theory basically says is we should recognise these three city types, respect them and regenerate them. And I'll just quickly illustrate that. So if you wanted to read about it, this is the book that, that's got most on that, but we're writing another one at the moment. The old walking cities which are around from the past 8,000 years are essentially dense, mixed, and you can walk across them in, 
uh, in half an hour. Here's a, an example. This is Shabam in Yemen. You can see the dense, just, just enough width to walk through. Um, and you've got a few cars in one corner there that uh, had to knock down a few buildings to put them in. Um, if you go to the centre of Tokyo or New York or London, the old walking cities are alive and well and they are thriving at the moment. They are in fact where the financial centres are, where the, so much of the economy happens um, and they are very important to any city to get right. Um, the walking city, if you are going to respect it, they need to be dense with mixed use, um, a primary focus on walking infrastructure, enabling white collar people to meet and create projects. That doesn't happen in shopping centres, it happens in city centres. Coffee shops and so on are an important part of that economy and you need to create the walkability that enables that interaction and you need housing close by. That's the walking city. Now you can see in a place like New York where they've taken the, uh, uh, the Broadway, which when you look at it now and, and, and with the uh, planning skills of, of young girl um, transforming that, it, it is just filled with people that's alive and, and, and functioning extremely well. Um, and you, you won't go back. They won't put cars back in that space because it's, it's, it's respecting the walkability of it recognising it and regenerating it, making it function better. Um, and reclaiming the walkability from traffic is another big feature. Now, for the first time we can see cities actually taking out major freeway structures. And uh, the most iconic one is this one in Seoul where this freeway, which was um, built over the top of a river, in fact a sacred river, and about eight years ago, the, the public demanded that it get taken down. Now, nobody really expected this to happen, but one of the mayoral candidates said, yeah, I'll take that down, and he got elected. <laughs> and you can imagine him walking into the tra transport department saying, okay, guys, it's coming down. But to make it even more amazing, he was the in charge of the company that built the freeway. But he did take it down and you've now got a 10 kilometre long central city park, a restored river uh, and, and a highly walkable area. It just, people love to go there and it's, it's full of special features, the biodiversity is coming back and that mayor was then elected the president. So it doesn't, doesn't hurt your politics. Um, and the Tonga Chang, he said, is now the symbol of the future green economy. So there are many cities that are contemplating taking out those kind of structures. That's a very new era. Now Melbourne is, is one of the cities that um, I think has demonstrated this walkability most. And no doubt you've heard Rob Adams and others talk about it, but it is a city that has always had good walkability characteristics, but it had to rediscover it. It had to recognise the importance of it and regenerate it. And they used Yarn Girl to help them on that in 1994 and then again in 2004. So he's got data on how the city has changed. And in 10 years, you can transform a city. And believe me, I haven't been here for 10 years and I can see the changes in this city. Um, it, it's a very beautiful central area and they have improved the streetscape a lot but the number of people living downtown you can see this in in 1994 uh, and how quickly it changed and then building street trees uh, every street you can see there had had new street trees put in and you can see the befores and afters um, outdoor cafes something we now assume look how many there were in 1994 and then Bang. It's a central part of how that economy functions now, that central area of Melbourne. The old laneways brought to life and, and many more of them every week being put through this. So the pedestrian activity in that city is very impressive. They had a 40% increase in the number of pedestrians moving around the city, 100% in the evening 
and stationary activity, sitting around watching, just looking at the city go by two to three times. Now, there are many other cities I in Europe that you can see these walkability characteristics, and, and the bike, in fact, is one of the, f the factors that uh, um, extends the walkability of the city. So you can go further out if you have more and more cycleways. So bu building cycleways is very important to that walkable centre as well. And um, Perth is only 1.3% there, but we are growing. <laughs> um, so what about Perth? Um, it, it is a city built around the car. Uh, we have a very strong planning system, totally geared to building a car-dependent city. And we brought young girl in the early 90s. We were the first city to actually discover him. And uh, he did this study and uh, a lot of these things have happened since. So there is a lot more life now in the city centre. The walkability of the centre is significantly better. Lots of interesting things for kids to do and, and uh, people to walk around. But St George's Terrace was traditionally the, the financial centre, the commercial centre. It was boring as bats here after five o'clock. Nothing ever happened there and every, you know, it was called Dullsville. And, um, but now it's, it's remarkably changed. And last year they had to widen the footpaths and take out a lane of traffic each direction. Now that's a bit like taking down that freeway in Perth and the complaints, oh my God, the city's going to collapse. Um, but in fact, nobody notices now. It's significantly improved um, and the walkability is so much better. You can even now get coffee there on the, on the street. Uh, it, it has got a long way to go. If you look at the old photos of the old trams and the, you know, the before the car, basically, the, 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 the cities did function pretty well. So there's, there's a way to go still. Um, there are a few significant, um, very high quality urban developments. BHP built this. Um, it's a re restoration of a whole city block with a, a big tower as well. And uh, it's full of very interesting places to go and um, a significant improvement. Now, mostly in Perth, we do modest and frugal in terms of architecture. But we've got a few buildings now, a few iconic kind of buildings. And um, that reflects, I believe, a sense of growing up, of believing in yourself a bit and saying, yeah, we can compete. We can do this. We don't have to just say, oh, oh, that's too much. We, we, we don't do that. Um, mostly that's uh, been our history. Now I get a sense of that in Auckland, that, that, that you are, are moving towards a more, uh, a self-belief, uh, a stronger self-belief that you can do things um, now that, that other crazy places have done. And so the, the new city centre is being built over the top of the railway line now and this is the kind of things that we're suggesting will go there. Um, young girl also had a, uh, a, a, a commitment to bring the city back to the, the, the river. It grew next to the river, but then we filled it in for the car. There's massive freeways and interchanges and so on that cut us off from the river. So they said, you've got to bring it back. And so the first step in that was to get rid of this freeway uh, on-ramp. And... That was taken down when the new Esplanade station was built. And uh, nobody even notices now that that's gone. It's, it's disappeared. And the, uh, the station is now a very active part of the city. And the next thing is to build this little bit of Dubai there, which is quite dense, walkable, kissing the river, and is um, totally built around the station that's there. Now you couldn't possibly have done this uh, unless you had that um, electric train service there bringing 100,000 people a day in, into that area. And <coughs> the interesting thing is that the main road, which used to go along the foreshore there, you now have to wind your way back into the city to go around. And oh, the western suburbs people who complained about the fact that, you know, this is cutting off their, their way back to the suburbs. Um, but in fact, it 
it is going to be sensational and, and will be, um, again, you won't miss that bit of road. There are a number of sites like this. The Perth Cultural Centre, it used to be uh, an area that, that was quite dangerous to go to. Um, Josh Burns, a, a, a landscape architect working in our institute, and he did this development with a, uh, he built a wetland there on top of the concrete. And you can follow on his website, joshburn.com.au, uh, the return of the, the wildlife to that. And today I saw a very rare bird has, has started to nest there. So uh, it's quite something to have in the, right in the heart of the city, that kind of activity. And uh, he also built um, uh, what's called the Urban Orchard, also on top of an, a car park. Um, a and uh, that is um, growing food and lots of people come to that area now and it's much more attractive. We have built residential activity uh, quite close to the city. The, the, the city population's gone from 300 to 30,000 uh, very rapidly. Um, and this is in a city with no density tradition. So there is an attraction. If you build it, they will come as long as they can walk, as long as they can get to something interesting. The amenity is there. Um, th th that uh, housing will, will work. And I have just taken a few quick snaps around the city. It, it is a very interesting place now to see the emergence of these uh, lovely spaces with people using them and the uh, building of apartments and offices in uh, close to the city centre there and the revival of the waterfront, which has been um, clearly uh, an ongoing project and, and no doubt will just keep going all the way around and take over the port eventually. <laughs> and you'll get rid of this. I mean, these, these are the things that happen when you start this journey. Uh, it now looks inappropriate in a, in a walking city. You are discovering and recognising and rejuvenating this walking city, and that doesn't belong. The transit city came from the 1850s right through to about 1940, and it followed the tram lines and the train lines, and you had two different types of urban development. Firstly, the tram city fabric, you can see this in the Sydney Road in Melbourne, which uh, is typical of a, a tram line. Now, you had trams, and you can still see that kind of urban fabric following the tram lines, and they're very popular areas. That's, that's where a lot of urban regeneration has happened in recent times, and uh, that is an important part of the city. Uh, you can also get train city fabric where you have a faster service, and it, the, at the station area, you then have a, a much more dense development. This is the pearls on the string type uh, urban development. And I think it's important to see which of that you are likely to have. With electric trains, you need train city fabric. And uh, the transit city needs fast and efficient transit linking the centres together down each major corridor. Um, you should be planning that every corridor has a transit city down it and you need medium density housing around that and this is where major institutions should be. They should not be away from transit lines. Uh, if you've got a lot of people going to hospitals or education centres, they should be on, on these transit corridors. Now in Perth, we have had a rail revival. This. Um, story I told yesterday in much more detail. I'll just quickly go through. This is the Perth City Station. Um, and this is me in 1979 when the, uh, when, when the government closed our railway down. Now that was a very good decision because we would have just gone along with a very poor system, get letting it run down and run down and run down like most cities in the world were doing at that time and certainly all Australian cities, there was no investment in rail happening. Well, they closed ours down. And we got a group of 12 or so people together, formed the Friends of the Railways and ran a campaign. And we won that campaign. This government was thrown out, and in 1983, 
they reopened the Fremantle Railway. And you can see on the, uh, the memorial to the closing and the reopening on the, on the Perth station. Um, and it was pretty significant events for us. But the, the reality is the public of Perth said we want a railway, very loudly, and threw the government out. And so they brought it back. But what do you do then? The next phase is to say, well, we've got to build something decent out of this. So we started the electrification process. And um, if you um, uh, notice this, that, that train there is now one of yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more of our story because we've just, just had a, uh, a rail project announced and then stopped because we couldn't fund it. And uh, the, the public servant who did the deal on this and bought those trains from us stood up at my seminar yesterday and said, um, if you're having trouble with uh, getting some trains, um, we've got some old trains we could <laughs> sell back to you. <laughs> So this is the system we've now got and I still get amazed when I see how quickly it's happened. So the old heritage rail lines were there, they went east-west and once the electrification was done, everybody wanted one of them and that will happen. First of all we built the northern line and then the southern line is the most recent one. Now both of them go deep into car dependent city suburbs. They are not designed for railways. They never were. And all the transport planners said it's not going to work. These, uh, you know, you can never get people out of their cars from those kind of suburbs. But it was a dramatic success. The, uh, the Southern Line, for example, was built at 17 million per kilometre. It cost about 50 million a kilometre to build one lane of traffic for on a freeway in our system. This now carries eight lanes of traffic. So it's very cheap in comparison to you know, what um, you would have to do if you tried to build eight lanes of freeway there. Um, so it's been very successful and here's the numbers on it. The, southern, the northern line jumped up to there and plateaued because we couldn't get any more people on it. And then the southern line came in and, and that's starting to plateau. Here's Adelaide here, hardly any growth. And it's likely, to, they've just electrified also their system and I think they're gonna go through the same jumps. But uh, they are dramatic changes. Seven million passengers a year to 70 million passengers a year in, in a couple of decades. Now that's a pretty good story and not, not too many cities uh, have uh, can beat that, but I bet you in Auckland you will see a similar story uh, because the reality is taking the train down those corridors is now a lot faster than taking a car. Our trains do 130, by the way, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and they do reach that, um, and they go sailing past the freeway traffic that's stuck every day. But the important thing is that it is not about transport, it is about rebuilding the city. It is about enabling the city to be rehabilitated, regenerated, and certainly in the, the old walking centre of Perth, it has been a significant boost to enabling that city to, to, to revive. Um, so this is central, the central station, and this is a major government building built over the top of it. Um, and the the next phase is the, um, uh, the development along the top of the sunken railway line here that goes to Fremantle and that, that all of the city centre activity is now moving that way. So the city is changing and it is changing because people can recognise that when you have a good rail service, development is attracted to it. And out in the suburbs, the each of the uh, stations have whole new developments are happening around them. Um, this is East Perth, which is one of our first attempts at high density, it was called, um, four or five storeys, and uh, 
that's now incredibly popular. Um, it's quite close to the city, that one. But you can now go out 33 kilometres to Joondalup and see similar kind of density, similar kind of activity around that station. And that's becoming a major sub-centre for a whole corridor out there uh, since the uh, train came through. The Southern Line has got a, a few centres emerging. One's called Coburn Central, which is uh, getting this kind of development around it. And it is, um, it's, it's new Lynn-like. It's not, uh, you know, huge density, but it's enough for that centre to have significant numbers of jobs, uh, childcare centres, entertainment facilities, uh, youth uh, facilities, all kinds of things like that, and people living, being able to walk to the... Uh, to the train. The next phase for us is light rail and light rail is um, something that runs down the street. Uh, we did this study on the Knowledge Arc light rail which is designed to link together the key universities and health campuses and at UWA right through the city centre and out to Curtin. That was that route there. The government then uh, saw that and said, yeah, we like the look of that and we'll, we'll extend it out here to the northeastern suburbs which don't have much of a, a service and there's no freeway going out there where you can build a railway down the middle. So um, that was their, their next goal, to do that one. And developments like this big development that uh, right next to the, the Wacker and uh, the river there, um, they will not work unless you have this kind of light rail running through the middle of it. Now you have Britomart, you have uh, a whole new railway system that's, uh, that's coming. Uh, you have got redevelopment occurring and you've, you've got the sandbagged electric trains waiting to go. Um, and uh, it, it is um, a very exciting time. But the next phase is what you need to think about. What, what are you going to do next? And um, I think that uh, is important because at every one of the stages where we built something, the next stage followed and the next election was about that extension. And uh, at each of them, six or seven elections we had which were essentially about extending the rail system. And the Automobile City has come and essentially taken most urban development since the 1950s and it, it's taken us out into whole areas around the city and basically has become the model around the world and the suburbs have flowed. They can go out in any direction uh, with as long as they've got road access and the shopping centres have followed and cities like Los Angeles developed through there. Um, that says the National City Line removed transit in 44 cities all in one day. American cities never recovered from that. The trams, the, the trams in, in Los Angeles, the, the biggest system in the world, all taken out and they were bought by a company that was set up from uh, Standard Oil uh, and uh, General Motors and Firestone Tires. Uh, and they were, they were found to be in breach of um, antitrust legislation and fined $5,000. <laughs> but they wrecked 44 cities. And American cities have been trying desperately to build back some of that light rail into those th that urban fabric that was built around it. And there's about 100 cities now building light rail in America. Um, but uh, it really did set them back and in many ways uh, they are coming to terms with this in, with a lot of pain. But the, the key thing is that the town planning adopted the car-based city as its model and it said that is the city. The other parts, the city centre, the transit lines, the tram lines, they don't matter. There's just one city and it's all based around the car. Uh, and it's not the case. So the, there are, there's a model, it's called the four-step transport model. And it was used to predict where you should build the next, um, the next roads and expand the capacity. Uh, and you can see that with the, the little box there, it says 
that that uh, income, what did he say? Income and car ownership. There you go. Now that's the key input. But I'm going to show you some data now that shows that that does is totally meaningless, because it used to be that if you got money, you bought a car and you used it. Not so now. It's changing completely. So this model doesn't work anymore. It very. I'm not sure that it ever really did a lot for cities, but it, it was the basis of town planning. You, you rolled out the roads and you built around them. Um, now, I don't want to say that's wrong because I think you need to respect and recognise the car city as well. And how you rejuvenate that is a very important item for the future. Right now, you're rejuvenating the transit city and the walkable city. That's important. But at some point, you're going to have to do something about the suburbs as well. And they're not going to go away. And they are going to need cars to service them. So you do need good roads. Um, but perhaps there needs to be a balance now as we start to see the importance of the other parts of the city. And in, in reality, it's actually a very expensive city to build, especially if it keeps going the way it is. But it does need regenerating. And I've been speaking to Dushko Boganovic this afternoon. Is Dushko here? Dushko. There he is. I knew he'd come. Um, Dushko is an urban design friend of mine who um, spends a lot of time attacking the city council. Um, because he's looking ahead for the next 20 years beyond this phase and saying, what are you going to do about those suburbs? And they are going to be important to regenerate with the new technologies, the photovoltaics and green roofs and, and, and food production and water sensitive design and so on. They all needs to be part of the return of the city. Now, it's a little bit hard for me to say this because I've been just totally focused on getting trains back into cities because they can help us overcome car dependence. But those car dependent suburbs are there, they're going to need help and just don't forget them. But we do need a new model. The four step model is not going to work anymore um, and there are new things called agglomeration economies. See when, when you make the city centre really walkable and people start investing in there, Lots of people come back to work in the city and they interact together and that is the basis of the new economy. The knowledge and service economy needs people to interact and you can, you can do numbers on that. Agglomeration economies they're called and you can actually see what it does for the economy. So this is not just an issue of saying, oh, we've got to save oil and, and, and uh, get people out of cars to, s to save the planet from climate change. This is actually good economics. This is serious economics. And the other thing is to consider avoidable costs. Um, and avoidable costs are, for example, seeing if you do ex build on the urban fringe, there are big costs involved. For a start in Australia, somewhere between 85,000 and, and 100,000 is subsidised for every new block on the urban fringe. It's not often considered that it's a subsidy, it's just what you do all these services get provided, but it is money. It's costly. And if you have to drive a long way, the average these days is about $250,000 per dwelling over its lifetime. And that's a big help to your mortgage if you didn't have to use that. And you produce 4.4 tonnes per year more in greenhouse gases. The health because you walk more is, is improved and productivity also improves. So there are good hard numbers behind these um, alternative strategies. The overall message I want to make is that the trend around the world in the market is the need for more walking and transit city at the moment and less automobile city. We don't need to keep building further and further out for a while. That's clearly ought to be the agenda and, and uh, let me just quickly show you why. First of all, car use per capita is going down and this is a worldwide phenomenon. Public transport is growing rapidly, density is going up, the young and the wealthy are moving back into cities instead of suburbs 
and wealth, GDP, and car use growth are decoupling. So car dependence is actually losing its gloss. I won't uh, test you on this data. Th this is just a, a, we collect data on cities and densities have been going down regularly for 100 years um, and they've reversed. They're now going up again. Cities are, are building up in their density. And here's Sydney. The inner Sydney suburbs grew 15% in the first decade of this century. The middle suburbs 11.8% and the far outer Sydney, outer suburbs 6.5%. That's a complete reversal. Now you talk about having problems dealing with, you know, infill, uh, well, and, and the fact that, that you've got uh, a goal of 70% or so uh, infill and 30% on the, on the fringe. Most Australian cities have similar goals. In Sydney, it's now over 80% of development is happening back into the city. There's very little happening on the fringe. And they don't plan in Sydney. This is the market. Peak car use is, took me by surprise. I always thought that it was slowing down, but I never thought it would start going down. And after 100 years of car use, per capita, every year going up, it's now going down. This is the American data on all their cities. There's just no exception to it. Uh, peak in 2004, price of oil was $80 a barrel at that point, and um, that would be one of the factors. Um, every Australian city in exactly the same year, 2004, peaked and has been going down ever since. Sydney's traffic is now back to what it was in 1992. They haven't had a lot of population growth so that you can really see the difference. In Perth, we've had a lot of population growth like you and so the per capita is washed out and the traffic is actually getting worse and worse. But that is a reality that peak car use is upon us and you can look at most cities. In London, 19% drop in that first decade um, and there's a, a big emphasis you know they did the congestion tax but this is after that and it, it's um, it's continuing to drop big emphasis on the new cafe culture in America Richard Florida has written a book about this and he says cars are so yesterday young and rich leave guzzlers behind uh, there was a 23% decline in car use per capita in this 16 to 34 year old age group. Huge. That's a cultural change. And where are they going? They're coming, they're using the other alternative modes, but they're also moving back into cities where they don't need to travel as much. Now there's a limited amount that you can do that in. The walking cities and the transit cities of America are pretty limited. They've got massive suburbs like we do and uh, so there is a need to build that market up. In every city region, uh, car use, uh, rail is growing especially. Um, there is some bus growth but mostly it's rail and you can see there in Asia and Europe and Canada, Australia and the US growing. And this paper from Jeff Kenworthy has just come out. It shows that in the, the, the latest um, period, the, the uh, amount of passenger car kilometres per capita, per unit of GDP is going down. So we're getting wealthier and we're using cars less. Now that's what stuffs up the model. The model is basically saying, well, if you're going to get more uh, income, you'll, you'll put it into cars and grow. Not so. Something's happening. Now, this is our old graph which shows the car use and density in being very closely linked. So if you do inc start increasing density, car use will come down exponentially. That's what it shows. And you don't need much density increase to make that happen. You see the difference between Atlanta out there, it's got six people per hectare, massive car dependence and the Australian New Zealand cities there in the middle um, 
it, it's, it's not a huge amount of difference in the density. You can see it on here. This is the Auckland Plaster Wellington fitting the graph the same way. Now, the emerging cities, uh, everyone says this to me, so I, I have to include it. It doesn't matter what happens in Europe and America. China and India, they'll blow us away. They're all buying cars and they're ruining, going to destroy the planet. Um, and um, in America, they say that all the time. It doesn't matter about us. The Chinese, you've got to worry about. Well, let me just show you what happened in Shanghai. Dramatic change in the skyline and in the economic development of that city in the period 1990 to 2010. But when they started out in the 90s, they started building freeways. And the American engineers were all their key uh, advisors on this. It didn't last because when you've got very dense cities, very dense with very little car access, they fill. They say, what do you do next when you've got that? You build the metro. And the Shanghai metro was built in a decade. It was 420 kilometres of rail line there in a decade. And it carries 8 million people a day. So it's a dramatic change. So what's happening now in the Chinese cities, 82 Chinese cities are building similar metros. They know they can't go any further with the car. There is still car, you know, car buying happening, but only one in 100 families at the moment have a car. And you, you just can hardly use them in the cities there. Uh, there are now 16 Indian cities building metros. And all the Middle East cities are building them. Um, this is the Dubai rail there. And the um, Saudi Arabia has a trillion dollar rail system they're building. They must know something. Um, the next phase for Perth is something, uh, as we take this journey, as you are, uh, is worth considering. If we keep going further out, um, then that will be a 300 kilometre long city. And at the moment, that's likely to happen because we're not getting enough redevelopment happening. Um, and that's not acceptable to anyone. It's not sensible planning. And it will happen as long as the road lobby gets their way and they just keep rolling out the roads. But every now and then you get a good politician come along, and this is uh, Lana McTiernan, our Minister for Transport, when she was at work. Um, she, she built the Southern Railway. So it, it is a political story. And we had an election just a year ago where transport was the centre stage. It was the main issue. We, we did a study which showed what should happen next in Perth, and we came up with this plan now you can see what they've picked out there is a ring rail system that goes around the city. Uh, what we actually planned is this. Th th there's the ring rail and I inside it is a series of light rail. So that 15 kilometre radius there, that's the global city. And that's where the density needs to happen. But what kind of density? We said let's find the actual sites on the stations that we're planning and how many people could fit in there? How many jobs and people could fit there? And we found that the next 30 years of urban development in Perth could fit quite easily into those centres. And each of the centres was on the books with one or other local government anyway. Um, but how to make them happen? Nothing much is happening. You need to build the railway. If you build the railway, then you'll get the centres happening. You'll see with this electric rail how quickly land development will happen around it. So this is, this is what Perth looks like along the Swan River. This is Fremantle here. And you can see the sites that we've put in there as being where this focused development should happen. Now, it's not actually much of the city. Most of the city remains as suburbs. And the suburbs are very 
important to us as they are in Auckland. I can understand when the Save Our Suburbs movement says we don't want density around us. But we're trying to say we can get that kind of density and rebuild a transit city function and the suburbs can remain because they're near now a decent centre. And in those suburbs, the pressure is off the awful kind of infill, which is where you get these little units stuck in the back backyard, knocking down the trees and not actually providing anything to the area. There's no providing of public transport, water sensitivity, design, underground power. Nothing of that happens when you just get a, a few little units stuck in the backyard. Now, that's the only model that Perth and Auckland mostly are doing. We're trying to get a different model which says, let's build densely in certain spots and let's use that as the basis of building this rail. So that's what we try to get across for this election. <laughs> and almost nothing of the centre's discussion was had. It was all about the rail option. So we'd done all the numbers, by the way. We took all those numbers to show how much money it would save us. $3.9 billion would be saved if we did that approach. Build a lot of railway over that. Um, and these are the centres that we focused on that are already on the map, uh, including one at, S at, at Curtin University. Um, and one of the key things is that the knowledge centres are, are clearly centred. Uh, they're either in the CBD or in centres, and, and uh, uh, they are important for the economy. So we had this... Max Light Rail announced by the state government. As part of their commitment to the future, they said, we're going to build the light rail. Then the um, opposition came out with a project where they said they'd build the entire ring rail that we'd suggested. And they went zooming up in the polls. And it looked like the, the government was going to lose. So they had to announce something else. So they announced the airport rail. Now, nobody in government I know had even heard about this. <laughs> but it was announced. Um, and it is, it, it, it is, in fact, the start of the ring rail project. So well, I was very happy to support both of these rail projects. And I thought, terrific, we're underway. The journey continues. You know, we've been going for 20, 30 years on this. Let's keep going the next 20, 30 years. And it's bipartisan. We finally got it totally bipartisan. Unfortunately, uh, a few weeks ago, they announced that both of the projects are off the books. They are not going to happen. And uh, the Minister for Transport there, a week later, had a nervous breakdown and resigned from his ministry. Uh, the pressure was too great. In fact, they dropped 10% in the polls immediately. So we do take our train seriously <laughs> in this city and they couldn't find the money. Now, this is not an uncommon thing. You've got a, a CRL, is it, a planned? You've got to find the money. It's not easy to find. There's a lot of other competing things for our capital. So what do we do about funding it? Well, let me give you a message about how you could do it. And I really hope you can do it before we do, because this is on the agenda for us in, in Perth. It's called value capture, and it, is, uh, it has not really been tried yet in, in Australia or New Zealand. It is done in Europe and in uh, Asia and in America. In Copenhagen, the simple way they did it was just to get government land and make it part of a package and as a purely completely private rail project that built their entire metro in exchange for that land. It was a pretty big piece of land, it was a military base. Um, the second approach is what Hong Kong and the Japanese rail systems do. They buy their own piece of land around a station and when they build the train, they build uh, the the uh, land um, and uh, the the uh, financial 
centre in Hong Kong is actually owned by the MRT there. Um, and they make a profit out of the land. Now that's quite an entrepreneurial thing to do and, and um, there aren't too many governments prepared to do that. Um, the third mechanism is the American one and it's actually now being taken on in the UK. The Crossrail project and the new Manchester City deal where they're going to build three new rail lines uh, is being done this way. It's called tax increment financing and it essentially says that the land values are going to go up around stations. People will want to live and work there so the land values are going to go up. Now that value will translate into taxes increasing. There's not a new tax, it's just the rates or the land taxes or the capital gains tax or the GST on land sales. All of that money is going into government coffers and if you don't build it, there's no extra money going in. But if you do build it, then there's extra money going into the government. So all you've got to do is say, that's our money. We're hypothecating that. We're ring-fencing it and saying that can be used to set up a special fund and if you know how much is likely to come in there, that special fund sits there and it can be used to finance the railway. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a different way of thinking. It's hard to get your head around, but it is real. And it is what the Americans are doing. It is what the, the, the POMs are now doing. And Infrastructure Australia is really keen to do this in Australia, but we can't find anyone to take the risk and do it. They all want to do railway, and, but they all just want to get it out of general revenue. And they can't. There's not enough around. So it is a way of doing it. Now, we've got a report on it, which is um, there, but uh, there's a lot of written about it, and I can send you anything if you want. But what would it do in Perth? We actually did work with the Treasury and found that the land values have gone up around the railway lines, around the heritage lines, and even the southern railway. There was a 42% increase over a five-year period in the value of the land around the station. That is real money. And we then calculated that 40 to 60% of the cost of that Southern Railway could have been achieved by getting that value capture. Now, that's around a freeway with very few stations. But where it happened, you could have raised a lot of money to do it. Uh, light rail, and particularly uh, a, a rail like your building, where you've got really clear centres that are important, you can raise a lot of money from using that mechanism. And what it does is open up the possibility of private sector funding coming in to help. So we don't have to do it all with government funds. And that is the key message I'd like to leave you with that maybe you can learn from or do something about before, um, before we do. Uh, I hope that I'll be able to pull this off in Perth, but um, it, it's going to be hard. Now, mo mostly you talk about TODs. They are happening, but they need financing. They need help. And the reality is this is one way to do it. If you can integrate transport, land use and finance, then you've got a solution. In, in Infrastructure Australia, we 55% of our money went to urban rail. And that is um, because the benefit cost ratios were, were higher than, than the road projects. Um, but what we want to do next is get value capture as a key mechanism. Now I'm going to finish by just telling you a little bit about Christchurch because I think you should be extremely proud as New Zealanders of what's happening in Christchurch. I'm going there tomorrow to release this film we've made. It's called Christchurch Resilient City. And you can see it now on YouTube. Uh, and it's, it's uh, I was there for two months uh, last year as an Erskine Fellow and we interviewed some of the key people. And it's just remarkable to see what is happening there. So if I'm going to talk about the return of the city, here is a city returning and really, you know, you, you could have been forgiven for saying let's just abandon it. Um, uh, but in fact, the 
the kind of um, hopefulness that's there is creating not just a rebuild, but a whole new kind of city. And the, uh, the kind of entrepreneurs like uh, Sam Krosky, uh, who just says it's just a fantastic place to be at the moment. The opportunities are endless. Uh, it's extraordinary. Margaret Jeffries from Project Littleton with the incredible social capital of their community that was so recognised around the world for what they did. Um, Bailey Perriman wants to rebuild the suburbs with his Garden City 2.0, which is essentially about food production in the city. And uh, he's already getting a lot of traction on that. Ryan Reynolds from Gap Filler with amazing stories of... He's created $30 million worth of new small businesses in this area based on extraordinary ideas. Where they just tried them out because you had an opportunity to do something that you didn't have before. And the biggest story of all, I think, is this amazing new river park that is going to be the red area there, taking out the red zone, which is um, where people shouldn't have been living, but, uh, of course, everyone wants to live near a, a river, and uh, it, it's now finished as a, a place to live. Evan Smith was one of the people who, whose house has gone, and he's heading up um, this whole project to... to rehabilitate that river and it, it's a fantastic story and um, the cardboard cathedral I was there for the launch of the cardboard cathedral and Victoria Matthews gave an amazing sermon it, it is full of hope and uh, I think is a symbol uh, of a new thing which is a low carbon low cost and very beautiful and very livable uh, very walkable very nice area that is coming back to life there uh, based around that. So Christchurch is returning, so any city can return. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Peter, for um, what I'm sure was a uh, enjoyable presentation for everybody and uh, certainly had a lot of content in it and uh, a couple of reflections I think before we have some questions uh, from the floor if you're a car salesman you probably need to start looking for a new job according to Professor Newman um, I think uh, your worship the Mayor Lynn Brown's arrived and uh, Deputy Mayor Penny Holt welcome thanks for coming I think you've heard most of the presentation um, just a couple of reflections as well uh, Peter we uh, we topped last week uh, 11 million trips passenger trips, annual trips on our rail network last week, which was a significant milestone again for us, particularly as electrification is coming in. It pales into insignificance, of course, for Shanghai at 8 million trips a day. Uh, and, and having spent a couple of years living in Shanghai, I can tell you that riding the uh, metro in Shanghai, I lived above Nanjing Shilu uh, Station for a couple of years, and uh, riding the metro, there is a very personal experience. You get uh, very close to a lot of people, uh, and you get to smell them and hear them, and... Uh, and uh, know a lot about their life, but it is certainly the way to go. And again, if we move to other uh, Chinese cities like Beijing, uh, you know, 20 million population in Beijing, I used to go there every week, uh, and five million cars on the road, even in inter-peak times on the road, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ring roads, which are elevated roads in Beijing, are five or six lanes wide, and they're at crawling pace at 11 o'clock in the morning or 1 o'clock in the afternoon or just about any time. So it is impossible to travel by uh, motor vehicle in Beijing at any particular time. And so hence the underground metros are so, so significant. Um, so questions from the floor. If anybody's got any questions, I would ask, rather than ask you a question, if you could just wait for a microphone to come to you. We are audio and video taping this session. So uh, if we'd just like to take some questions from the floor. One from the lady down there. I have a, an unusual question, not specifically about rail. I saw something on the television um, last year, I think, about a city in Brazil. I think it was Rio. And they had these kind of pods t that, that travelled through their, um, their slums, erected on very tall poles. And they were talking about that as a potential transport system for the future. I just wondered if you had any comment on that. Uh, yeah. Um I've been to uh, Mazda where they have 
these electric pods. Um, they're, uh, they take four people, and which is pretty much a car. Uh, they're electric. I think you can get electric cars. Uh, I couldn't see a lot of advantage. They don't have much capacity. They are being um, run by computers rather than a driver. So you can sort of put a few more into the system and we probably will get Google cars where you, you know, you, you just let your car get taken over by Mr. Google and driven through the city. Um, but that doesn't do a lot for the capacity of the system and uh, there's nothing quite like a train. The numbers very quickly are uh, one lane in an ordinary suburban street carries about 800 cars an hour on a freeway, you can get up to 2,000 cars an hour or people an hour down that. Um, if you've got a busway, you can get five to 10,000. Uh, a light rail, 20,000. A heavy rail system can take 50,000 people an hour. So we're talking 20, 30, 40 times as many people who can get carried down the same space. And any kind of dense city, and we do need density in order to make the economy work, uh, you, you're going to run into space problems. Uh, so the, 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 the trains are going to be necessary and I, they haven't come up with any alternative and the pods are one of the, the, uh, the, the it, it's kind of Disneyland-like, it's just fun. Thank you, and I think we've got another question over there. I'm sure you meet people in Perth who are like me, who are happier to walk everywhere in the daytime and uh, to live our daily lives uh, using public transport and walking. On the other hand, uh, the things that make living in Auckland or living in a city like Perth wonderful uh, those are those last few percent of journeys going out to a nature reserve or somewhere where you need to drive, um, the sports ground, whatever it is that makes uh, your particular life wonderful in a city like this. Um, as we have a conversation about change to sort of wean ourselves off this addiction to cars, using them all the time, using them uh, for low value journeys. Do you have any suggestions about how we can guarantee those other side, that last few percent of journeys where you will need a car because of the nature of our geography? Um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, I've come up with this idea only fairly recently and I did it with a group of people in Singapore who were looking at the future. What's the next major thing you could do in a city like Singapore, which is based around its innovation? And we came up with the idea of a card, not a car. The card would enable you to have access to bike sharing, car sharing, taxis, uh, small buses, big buses, light rail, heavy rail, and would enable you, because of the digital systems that are now available, the information, to have a provider who provides you with that card and enables you to book all of those into a seamless way of you getting around any day or any week or for any plan that you have. So as long as you've got the card, you don't need a car. But you'll still use a car as part of that. And the thing about car sharing is it replaces eight cars because it's being used most of the time. It's like a taxi. Um, so cars do have their benefits, particularly in that, that flexibility. When you pour them all down one street or one stretch of road, and try to turn it into a mass transit device, they fail. So let's get mass transit where you need it and y cars where you need it in those flexible last mile and first mile kind of trips as well as the flexible things you need if you're going to the hospital at quarter to four in the morning or going to a nature reserve where there's uh, un unlikely to be any bus service. Uh, that's where you get your car sharing car and, and, and you do it. So mobility, multimodal mobility will be there. We, I think we will continue to be a mobile species. We're not going to just sit around a computer screen. We will do more of that, but there will be plenty of opportunities and I don't see why growing new cities like Perth and Auckland couldn't try that as well as a place like Singapore who are very keen to establish that, not just because they want a better mobile system. They, they actually want to demonstrate innovation and make money from it, to take it around the rest of China and so on then. So if we start to think that way, 
some of these experiments, what you're going to do with your new urban rail system and how you link it in and integrate it, you need to be able to show the rest of the world how to do it as well. And, and that's one of the, the ways I would think about multimodal mobility. Call it the M3 card. Or the AT hop card. Um, <laughs> thank you. Just a uh, question down there. Yeah, uh, this is Graham East, member of the Campaign for Better Transport. Uh, you spoke about funding uh, and how that's critical to the success. You can have all the wonderful plans, but without the money, you aren't going anywhere. But I'm interested also in how you link uh, getting good quality land uses around, not just any old development, but uh, high quality development. What kind of um, regime do you have in Perth to ensure that you, you you get that sort of development that really is going to be popular and and populated? Well, the the if you come to Perth and do a transit oriented development tour, you'll go to East Perth. You'll go to uh, um, Subiaco, you go to Coburn Central, Joondalup. These have all been government guided and particularly the Metropolitan Redevelopment Authority as it's now called. Um, they did help with land development that uh, needed to have a whole lot of replanning, fixing up the land. It was often contaminated land from old industry um, and, and then enabling a public-private process to, to build it with very heavy regulations and requirements on the scale and form of the design and the placemaking processes, the walkability and, and how it looked and felt as you walk around it. So those kind of detailed planning, they are critical. So Ludo needs to be part of this process. Um, and, and, and those kind of design skills are critical to increasing the value of the land. Uh, you won't get um, the, the, the real benefits unless you have that detailed planning. Now, there are people around who are very good at that. Uh, Janet Sada Khan is the next one who's coming on this Auckland conversation. She's really good at that kind of detailed planning. And, uh, and, and when you've got an eye for it, as Jan Girl has and so on, um, you, you see immediately the benefit of it. Uh, so you do need government to be involved in that process, but there is also some very clever entrepreneurial private sector people out there who are raring to go with their ideas about how to bring a place to life, and um, they wouldn't want me to suggest that the only thing you've got to do is control it with government regulations. There, there needs to be a proper partnership in that process, and uh, I, I think that's the great thing that I would really happen is um, the, uh, the way in which if you get the private sector involved, you can set the guidelines and you could get expressions of interest for how you could build, own, operate and create these beautiful, dense centres around stations and you have a competition for it and you pick the winner and you'll find that the cost will go down because they are competing for it. Uh, but also you, you can get a very strong look at what they're really intending to do with that kind of development. It's a very exciting possibility. If, uh, um, uh, if you can go down this track, you, you can get some really sensational urban development. The key thing about trains is it's not a transport device, it's a city building device, so it's, you've got to do it right. Well, thanks, Peter. I think there might have been a bit of a cue. That one last question, please. And Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my suggestion for your uh, your, your uh, people in Singapore for their card is perhaps the Hop Sing. Um, but that's my question relates to uh, the funding mechanisms that you've, you've outlined to us in concept. They seem to focus on capital funding for the initial construction, but they, mu they must carry with them some undertakings across the, uh, across the providers for presumably subsidised operating costs. And I just wonder if you can open up a little bit about the Perth experience in terms of going as far as you have gone for our benefit. Yeah. Well, there's not a lot to learn from Perth on that, except that by building the trains, the operating expense um, as a proportion of uh, revenue uh, 
became very much better. Uh, the, 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 the southern rail and the northern rail just, just about break even in their operating costs. Um, they're very, very efficient. And you can make very efficient uh, rail systems now. And you've got one driver with 600 people replacing 20 buses. Um, it a actually does help. And um, the, um, but it's still subsidised. We have a totally government approach to public transport. And we've been through that era where we were just trying to keep it alive. Now, there's a huge growth. The Southern Railway grew 19% a year ago. Uh, it, 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 there is a market. So let's get the private sector in there. Now, the idea of land value capture, you probably didn't quite pick it up, but if you are developing this fund through the increase in value of land, that keeps going. So it's an operating fund as well. And it can go into funding the, the rail scheme, which is why you could do it totally private, actually. That is possible. It opens that possibility up. And that takes it off the books altogether. <laughs> Treasuries are pretty pleased about that. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks very much. I'm sure uh, Peter will maybe hang around a little bit afterwards if you've got any other questions that you uh, want to ask him. But uh, just before I uh, formally thank him, I just sort of have a couple more reflections uh, that I gleaned from your presentation, Peter. And, and uh, it appears pretty, pretty clearly to me that if you go down and kiss the river, Everything comes right, and uh, these things will just uh, drop out of uh, out of nowhere. And there must be a few planners in the audience tonight, because I heard a few of you ripping up your conventional four-step planning model and throwing it in the bin. And no doubt tomorrow around the coffee table there'll be lots of discussion about agglomeration economies and uh, what we have to develop there. But probably the most disturbing uh, part of your presentation that I found today was I hope that there's no mayoral candidates out here because all you've got to do is pull some big stuff down and all of a sudden you become the mayor. So I hope you're uh, not all in the audience tonight. So on behalf of Auckland Council, Auckland Transport and our sponsors tonight, uh, I'd like to uh, warmly thank uh, Professor Newman uh, for coming all the way from Perth to address us tonight and I'd ask you to show your appreciation in a normal way.